Hi, this is The Philosophical Angle, defining concepts in current media. I am your host, Chris Angle, and I am the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Philosophical Equations of Economics. These books are available free online for viewing at www.philosophypublishing.com. Along with me is uh, my panelist, Rick Samuelson. Rick graduated from Yale, has an MBA from Wharton, an MA from Tufts, and he's retired from the investment banking industry. Welcome, Rick. Thank you. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of concepts and topics being used in current media and offer an explication of its essence. This week, we're going to talk about the recent Supreme Court decision about Obamacare being constitutional. And so let's go to the uh, let's go to our board and talk about it a little bit. First, I think we need to decide what is freedom in the United States. And freedom is the one, the establishment of a priority. And that is a thought. And the second is the effectuation of a priority, which is an action. Now, a priority is something that the mind comes, your free, your consciousness will come to order the information that comes into your brain. So, if you have a, uh, if if information comes to you, your mind establishes priority in that how important it is to you. And when information is attached to a priority, it then becomes knowledge. So let's again review the uh, definition of freedom. It's an establishment of a priority, that is information that has come into your brain, that, uh, that uh, you have attached a, a uh, amount of importance established a priority to it and how important it is and then you act on it as in an action. And in all cases, once you decide you can either have an action or you can have not an action. After the establishment of a priority, you can either effectuate that priority or you can not. So now let's go to a general diagram of the Obamacare decision at the Supreme Court. This little symbol here means uh, person. It's what the uh, probably uh, the Chinese symbol for person. So we use it here to abbreviate. So we start with freedom. Individuals have freedom. They live in freedom, at least somewhat. And I've made the uh, astounding assertion here that freedom is, is good. And why would freedom be good? Why, uh, why is uh, maybe less freedom is better? Well, freedom is good because if we go back to our original priority scheme here, we notice that priorities are made up of knowledge. So the greater amount of freedom is good because you're going to have a greater amount of knowledge a greater that's being established from information. So the uh, now, with the action of the Supreme Court, the question is whether you have to buy health care or not, or whether the government is mandating you to buy health care or not. And they do this by an incentive. And the Supreme Court called it a tax. So by coercion of taxing, making the incentive either larger or smaller, making the freedom lesser or greater, whether to buy this specific product. So, but it doesn't have to be this specific product. It could have been anything. If we take the precedent of using tax as an incentive to make a decision, then all your decisions can be coerced 
or not by the government. So let's go, if, let's say you want to buy something, let's call it health insurance or let's call it a piece, a toothpaste at Walmart, it doesn't really matter. You're using, you sacrifice your risk, your information, your knowledge, your time, your effort, and in some cases your material to get a reward. In every decision you have, you are incentivized or you have decided that you need to do something and you want to do it to, in order to get a reward and a reward is good. You've established that naturally you want to, uh, your reward is, a, is something that's good and will make your life better. And so you, that's how your decisions are made. So when we, if the reward becomes less and less relative to the sacrifice, you're not going to do something. So, for example, when laws and regulations are deemed constitutional and the government uh, has its priorities, such as the government has established a priority, and that priority now conflicts with or might conflict with your priority of whether to buy toothpaste at Walmart or whether to, uh, uh, to buy health insurance. But the government has established its priority and its priority now, due to this decision, making you to into, uh, buy its taxation system to cause an action where otherwise you might have no action. That means less freedom because your priority may have established that you don't want something and you've gone to non-action. And so you, since you have less freedom, also there's less knowledge in society overall. So with that uh, introductory remark, let me uh, let me invite my uh, panelist, Rick, for any, uh, any remarks that he might want to make. Rick, what do you think of the uh, Supreme Court decision on Obamacare? Has it lessened our freedoms? And our freedoms, actually, and our, our freedoms uh, in, in, the, uh, in the American Constitution or the other documents that surround it, is freedom protected? Is there a conflict between the freedom uh, that has been lost with the Obamacare decision and uh, those freedoms that we thought we might have had. What do you think? I think any answer to that question has to be very carefully worded. Uh, my comments are informed almost exclusively by the National Review. There was a series of articles in the July 30th edition. Uh, and, of course, the decision handed down by the court was surprising and disappointing to many conservatives because it up upheld the Obamacare. In other words, what only happens with Obamacare is going to have to be decided legislatively. Uh, that it had, in its original form, that it would have impinged significantly on our personal freedom is, I think, pretty clear. Uh, some of the comments I've read are very interesting in terms of what did not happen. And Chief Justice Roberts seems to have been played the pivotal role here. What did not happen is that the authority under the Commerce Clause was not expanded. And the history they cite is one of constant expansion of, a fed of federal authority at the expense of the states since basically FDR's era. And we don't have the time to go into all that, but it's been a pretty steady march in one direction until quite recently. 
and this serves as a further explicit limit on the federal government's power under the Commerce Clause to regulate everything. And that's good. Uh, that they did it by describing the mandate to have to buy this stuff as a tax, when in fact it's a penalty, is troubling only in that it, it confuses the two concepts uh, and surely there will be further other cases in the future where that concept of what's a penalty versus a tax will rise again because it is in fact not a tax, it's a penalty, very obviously. So it's a question of choosing the lesser of two evils, the one evil being to allow the mandate or, or rather the Obamacare to stand unchallenged, the lesser evil being to, through a legislative slate, uh, not a, a judicial rather, sleight of hand, describe what is in fact a penalty as a tax. And on balance, since the court clearly didn't want to appear to be legislating from the bench, they probably made the better decision. Not the ideal decision. Um, and the, the challenge for conservatives is simply to repeal Obamacare. That's the next step. That's the next obvious step. And I think that is what just Chief Justice Roberts has implicitly encouraged the American public to do. It's, it surely seems so. Um, but then why need a Supreme Court if uh, a constitutionality of a law comes by and the, and the Supreme Court goes, well, you know, really, um, we're going to pass on this. We'll, uh, we'll just... Uh, We'll just let the legislature uh, make its decision uh, after the next election whether they want to go ahead with this. Why, why even have the Supreme Court to make a decision on this? Doesn't it, uh, doesn't it sort of make its purpose nugatory? I guess it depends on your perspective in history. Uh, if, if, I were, if the Supreme Court were looking at this decision in the 1800s uh, and was interpreting the Constitution in a way that was much closer to the vision of the founders, I mean, they would have wondered how we ever got to this place in the first place. Right. Viewed from today where we have a whole series of precedents, uh, most of them dating from FDR's days, that have, you know, continued to expand this Commerce Clause so that at the expense of the states, uh, we now, the question is how, how do you proceed from here without disturbing all of these precedents or overturning them uh, outright? And I guess a true conservative would argue, well, just so what? It's the, the, the precedents were wrong. The New Deal was wrong, at least in terms of how it expanded uh, federal authority under the Commerce Clause. And so, scrap it. Um, I guess the, his, the, the culture of the Supreme Court is they don't tend to move that dramatically. Uh, I suppose they, uh, on the they, side I, of those who wish they would move more dramatically, but that doesn't appear to be the culture of the court. And that's true because the, uh, the, really the culture of the court is to let the decision or let the precedent stand. Um, but so with that said, really, is there, a, is there a need now for a constitutional amendment on the uh, clarifying the, the role of the Interstate Commerce Clause? What do you think? I, I suspect there should be uh, a, uh, a, a constitu constitutional convention convened to be able to address this and the loss of freedom that uh, has been uh, caused by the misinterpretation of this clause. What do you think, Rick? Well, I, I tend to think of the founders as being 
in general, far more visionary than certainly modern participants in the legislative and judicial process give them credit for. And my view is, generally speaking, if you follow the actual text of the Constitution, these issues are pretty clear. In and, what way? Well, I mean, I'm, obviously, I'm I don't, I don't think, now, I'm not sure I can agree with that, whether they're clear or not. The Commerce Clause says this, the federal authority is meant to regulate a commerce amongst the states, and that the rest of the regulatory power lies with the state. Right. So, I mean, on the face of it, it would seem that most regulatory power over business would lie with the states, because think about the way that's worded. Uh, if it's only commerce involving state to state or cross states or among states that the federal authority should be regulating, that, that seems like a, a very bright line in terms of how that's defined. Yeah, so why the it, huge... It, it wasn't worded the other way around, in other words. True. And so why the huge deviation possible if, this, if, the, if the clarity of, uh, of the uh, clause is, is so readily understandable, why the huge deviation? Is there well, any I think explanation you have, for that? Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt to thank for that. Oh, we do, and he, of course, the famous uh, part where he packs the court with guys that are going to agree with, with his uh, ideology and his motivation to, uh, uh, to move America in a certain direction. Nevertheless, it has been exacerbated and expanded along those lines by subsequent courts, and yet the understanding should be is fairly obvious, but it's been contorted and expanded so that freedom in America has been greatly diminished. Are there, are there not constitution, other constitutional um, protective uh, notices within the constitutional documents? I'm not speaking just of the Constitution, but there are other uh, documents that, that preceded the Constitution that, uh, and, and sub, and, and post-date the Constitution, such as the Federalist Papers, that also uh, gives the clear in intent of the, uh, of the document itself. And yet, the distortion is magnificent, or uh, maybe not magnificent is not the right word, but has been magnified and expanded. What do you think? And I think Yes, I agree, and I think it's of a piece with this notion that uh, amongst modern commentators and analysts and so forth that somehow, well, the economy's gotten much more complicated and therefore central control is much better uh, place to regulate and, and, and manage across the whole country and somehow introduces efficiencies that are lost if you have numerous uh, state regimes. And as a conservative, I, I think that's totally false because I'm of the belief that anytime you give the federal authority more authority beyond what is stated in the Constitution, you have a government apparatus that feeds on itself. And instead of getting efficiencies, you get replication. Uh, so that functions that are already historically under the aegis of the states are replicated yet again at the federal level and it's all less efficient and there's more red tape and the economy is less effective and that's my view. Right, and uh, good to point out because I guess last year just uh, I guess there are about seventy thousand pages of regulations in place. Uh, so uh, 
and that's only at the federal level, and then we add in the state level, and it's, it's mind-boggling, and people wonder why the economy is not going anywhere. Um, is freedom protected anywhere in our documents, Rick? I mean, there are well, some. There, yeah, we have the First Amendment and we have the Second Amendment, and uh, uh, and of course, in the Declaration of Independence, we uh, we have a clear uh, declaration of of uh, of freedom, and that uh, uh, coming right out of Locke, by uh, written by Jefferson. However, the Supreme Court tends to not look at the preceding documents, such as the Declaration of Independence. Uh, when they uh, when they uh, take a view on the Constitution, unfortunately, uh, and uh, I think it's a something that should be taken to be able to clarify the intent of the founding fathers. What do you think, Rick? Are freedoms protected in the Constitution? Yeah, I, I, I'm not enough of a constitutional expert to comment on how general freedom, how much general freedom is protected in the Constitution. Obviously, there are numerous freedoms that are that, that are enumerated there that are protected, and uh, very specifically, and the, the the concept of freedom certainly flows the document in many, many ways. Uh, if I might I, interrupt again, here. Again, I, I would say that there's the Constitution, and then there we have this government, this history of building up this huge federal government entity that uh, feeds on itself. Right. And, you know, with all the regulatory activity that's occurred, uh, and the pages and pages of regulations that you allude to that keep being produced, I mean, it's become a kind of uh, creature unto its own. And this is what the average businessman and the average taxpayer has to deal with. Uh, and, and in a sense, is over time ever more distant from the basic protections of the Constitution because they're interfacing with this enormous government beast. Yes, that's true. But I want to go back to that remark about, uh, you know, without being a constitutional scholar, you, you, you might not be able to shed light on the problems here. But, you know, when the Constitution was, was being scribed, uh, no one was, was a constitutional scholar. Uh, and when these, all these documents were being made, they were, try they were made simply so that there would be no understanding. Yet, they have gone totally awry. And so I don't think, really, you need to be a constitutional lawyer in the sense that you, know, you need to know everything that's happened since the, the Constitution until now, but really, have been having just read the Constitution, understand its words and its ancillary documents uh, to know its intent. And I think the people of the United States just uh, probably feel that they've been had because freedom has diminished with this decision greatly. Rick, I want to thank you for uh, participating uh, today. And uh, that's about all the time we have for the philosophical angle and the Obamacare decision by the Supreme Court. Thank you.